Hi, I'm Eva Tenuto. I'm the executive director of the TMI project. Since I've been doing this since the beginning, I've already told at least 10 painful or embarrassing stories to the general public. It gets harder each time. I wonder if I'm gonna be able to find another one and then quickly discover that with just a little digging, I always tap into a never-ending well of shame and humiliation. <laughs> As you know, this show is the result of the TMI workshop Sari and I taught at the Mental Health Association. And as soon as we walk in the door, I feel like I have found my people. It is so refreshing, so nice to be in a room full of people who already know they're mentally ill. <laughs> Rather than being in our regular workshops where everyone's still trying so hard to hide it. More than half of our work is done right up front. But more than that, I feel the immediate sense of relief that comes with true kinship and camaraderie. Recently, there's been a lot of talk in the news and on Facebook about demystifying mental illness. And it's then that it occurs to me that the main reason I use Facebook is to cover up my own mental illness. I mean, I have this job in the truth-telling business, but I also have a background in marketing. I want to tell the truth, but I want to look really good doing it. <laughs> Recently, an old high school friend called and said, I can see from Facebook that you are doing fabulously. <laughs> uh, yeah, fabulously. <laughs> it catches me off guard. She thinks because she sees all these pictures of my nephew's sleepovers and Julie and me and all of our dates looking all blissed out in love. And it is true, my nephew is cute and my fiance and I are in love, but I don't post things like, Julie and I have slept in separate rooms for the last three nights because we got into a fight and have triggered each other so badly that we both actually think the other is our mother. <laughs> Neither of us want to sleep with our mother, so we're ever so grateful for the guest room. Click. No, I don't post things like that. I post the engagement pictures and keep that little mentally ill morsel to myself. I went through a rough spell this summer after one of my dearest friends passed away. I post a picture of the river view from my hammock and write, I would pay the mortgage on the hammock alone. What I don't post is, despite the July heat, I find it hard to do much else since Gabriel died than to wrap myself in a blanket and rock in a hammock like an inconsolable baby in a mother's arms. My increased need for comfort during this time of grief reminds me of when I was a nanny in the city in 1997, right after my grandmother passed away. I wish I had a nanny of my own and she could push me around in a stroller. Then I realized that strollers for adults are called wheelchairs and I better be careful what I wish for. I've had depression for a long time, depression of the clinical variety. My mother used to say to me, Oh, are you feeling blue again? Blue? Are you serious? Blue is the word that you choose for this disaster that sits before you? Well, what? You think that when you feel blue, it's worse than when other people feel blue? No. I think that when I feel blue, it's exactly the same as when other people feel blue. And when I feel clinically depressed, it's exactly the same as when other people feel clinically fucking depressed. Oh, well, if you put it that way. There is really no other way to put it. I remember seeing Oprah do a show of the inspirational variety about a guy with no legs running a marathon. And I lie there and think, why don't you do a show about someone with clinical depression getting up off the couch? That would actually inspire me. <laughs> just once, just once I would like to know what it's like to wake up happy and anxious to start my day. I wake up depressed because, oh, Fuck, another day is starting. I'd like to know what it's like to do laundry and as soon as it's dry, take it out, fold it, and put it away. My laundry becomes like a third person in our house. Sometimes it sleeps in bed with us or sits with us at the dinner table. <laughs> Sometimes it lies on the couch and watches movies with us. It rarely takes a quick and efficient trip right into a drawer. It's like putting a bill in a mailbox. It's so close, but so far away. For so long, I'm morally opposed to taking medication. 
pharmaceutical companies are trying to take over the world. They're trying to control us, over-prescribing, so we stop feeling and become complacent and they can own us. And I won't do it. No, I will not. I will not be owned by a drug. Yes, I'd love another glass of wine. Keep it coming. I'm not okay taking antidepressants, but I'm fine guzzling bottle upon bottle of what may as well be labeled depressant. Maybe all the conspiracy theories are true, but it's also true in my experience that if there's a chemical imbalance and it doesn't get balanced, nothing else seems to work. I did try other things before I gave in. St. John's work was a total waste of money. I start jogging. I mean, it's supposed to be physically impossible to feel depressed with all these endorphins, right? Well, every day I jog around Prospect Park, past the carousel, past the playground, the pond, and for all three and a half miles, I cry. I am defying laws of nature. I cry everywhere, in the laundromat, the gym, restaurants, bodegas, you name it, I cry there. It's particularly bad when I'm teaching preschool and cry more than the kids in my class. I hide in the corner of the playground hoping none of them will notice, but one little kiss ass always has something to say. Hey, Miss Eva, are you okay? Why don't you try using your words? <laughs> Fuck you, kid. You wouldn't understand. I hit my low at the apartment right under the BQE between Williamsburg and Dumbo. We call our neighborhood Dumbsburg. We live in a four-story atrocity. My friend Clara and I went to look at it with a realtor from Avalanche Realty. That should tell you something. <laughs> During what resembles a haunted house tour, we notice that everything is held together with caulk. The banisters, the door frames, the dreaded dark wood paneling, all of it reinforced with caulk. We take a moment in the dingy basement bathroom to discuss. She says, I fucking hate this place. I say, yeah, I know, me too. We should take it, right? <laughs> yep, and we do. We haven't been looking for that long, but we're homeless, and this place, although ugly, is huge. It isn't until after we sign the lease and send our deposit that we realize that all of the windows have been framed in old lady diapers to keep out the breeze. I suppose it's no wonder that it's in this building that I break down. I wake up one morning crying, and I can feel it, the depression coursing through my blood. I feel contaminated, defective. My mom calls, I answer the phone crying, and I can't stop. She doesn't know what to do for me. Is anyone home? No, I'm here by myself. Oh, God, I hate to think about you all alone when you're like this. Mom, it doesn't make a difference. Well, can't, can't you do something? Why don't you, I, I, I don't know, why don't you go talk to a neighbor? Talk to a neighbor? Do you know where I live? At home, I might be depressed. If I go to the neighbors, I'd be dead. <laughs> oh, well, if you put it that way, I hang up the phone and know I better do something about this. I finally give medication a try. I can't believe what happens. After a few weeks, I feel a sense of myself that I haven't experienced since I was five years old. An inner peace and contentment. I have energy freed up from not fighting for my life every single day. I always thought that meds would rob me of my emotions, but all of a sudden I can feel anger, sadness, hurt, fear, joy. I have an array of feelings instead of just that one, that dreaded depression I always try to get away from. If the medication didn't work, I would have been screwed, but it did which confirms something I had resist accepting. I do, in fact, have a mental illness. After I stop drinking, I think, maybe I'm not crazy. Maybe now that I'm not swigging back bottles of depressants every day, I can be what I always wanted to be when I grew up, normal. Well, in my excitement about possibly being normal, I do what every other mentally ill person has done at least once in their lifetime. I go off my medication, just in time for the holidays. <laughs> that March, my friend and ex-roommate Clara comes to visit me. I've moved from the city back upstate again. She lived with me through the entire Great Depression, the pre-medication era. 
She knows the signs, not that it takes an expert. She knocks on the door. I, I try to get up, but my cheek is like glued to the upholstery. Ugh, fuck it, come in. She comes in and she goes to turn on one light and then another, but all of the bulbs are busted. The apartment smells like garbage. She has to tell me because in my state I don't know. Eva, you don't usually live like this. I don't, are you sure? I'm sure, you have to go back on your medication. Years have passed, and for the most part, I'm doing well. Although things can trigger about like the death of a dear friend. Some days you will find me and my pile of laundry, doing shots of liquid vitamin D together and soaking in the rays of my seasonal affective disorder lamp. We do what we can. I sometimes wish that I didn't have to take meds, but then I look at the life I get to lead with them. I get to take care of myself well. I get to witness all of these people tell their truth, release their shame, and become more of who they really are. I think about the unlucky gifted people who suffered through this disease before meds were available, like Virginia Woolf and Vincent Van Gogh, and I remind myself to be grateful that I have mustered up the courage to talk to you about this with both ears intact and no rocks in my pockets. <laughs>